People have been pointing out a lot of the similarities between the 2011 film Contagion and the current pandemic that we're all being told about, spreading across the world and keeping many of us captives in our own homes. The similarities are striking. The virus in Contagion is a coronavirus, and as we were first told about COVID-19, the fictional virus in Contagion comes from bats in Asia. It's also spread in wet markets. The West first becomes aware of the spread through viral videos coming out of Asia that are spread throughout the alternative media. The response to the virus is handled by the CDC and the WHO and other centralized authorities that supersede all the local authorities who are depicted as idiots that can't possibly understand the seriousness of the situation. Independent media is derided as not real journalism, but as crackpot conspiracy theorists. The film mentions the CDC's overreaction to H1N1 and explains it away as better safe than sorry, and people suggesting otherwise are just being short-sighted and probably want your grandma to die. There's also a mysterious miracle cure that's being touted and promoted before any research has been conducted. This is for Scythia. Hydroxychloroquine. They talk about social distancing, a term that no one had heard in 2011, and a term that everyone is painfully familiar with today. Right now, our best defense has been social distancing. We start tonight with the coronavirus pandemic. The White House task force warns people not to violate social distancing guidelines because if they do, it could spark a second wave of sickness. When the independent media journalist points out that the same people handling the pandemic are the same people that stand to gain financially from a vaccine. On your blog, you also wrote that the World Health Organization is somehow in bed with pharmaceutical companies? Because they are. That's who stands to gain from this. They're working hand in glove. He's depicted as a lunatic. In the end, of course, the world is healed by the vaccine developed by the Jewish doctor with the help of his black friend at the CDC and the selfless white woman who tests the vaccine on herself. And once the vaccine is administered, people are given a vaccination passport that allows them to go out into public. These are striking similarities. But maybe this is something that's very typical uh, of pandemic movies. What about the hundreds of other films made about pandemics? And also, why are there so many movies about pandemics? I decided to go through several films, and there, there are a lot, made about deadly viruses that threaten humanity, and see if they all had the same kinds of similarities that Contagion had. I watched movie after movie after movie about global pandemics, and... Honestly, none of the other films depicted a reality that so closely resembled what we're experiencing right now. But they did have something else in common, and we'll go back to that in a second. First, let's just go through just a couple of the films that I, I went through. The first film we'll take a look at is the 1980 movie, Virus. Now, Virus was quasi-produced out of Hollywood, but it's actually a Japanese film. They had an international cast, and it was made for international audiences. Uh, when they made the film in 1980, it was actually the most expensive Japanese film ever made. Virus is interesting because it represents a changing of the guard when it comes to a boogeyman that justifies the, the power of government. From World War II through the late 80s, the boogeyman was the USSR and the, the threat of communism. And while communism was and remains a threat to humanity... We all know that the self-appointed ruling class has never been interested in actually fighting communism, but were the original founders and defenders of communism. Now, that didn't stop them from using the constant threat of nuclear war from Soviet Russia to justify wars, increase surveillance, and trillions of dollars pumped into their wallets by way of the military-industrial complex. Much like when the, the Berlin Wall came down and, and communism finally failed in, in Russia, and Russia ceased to be the, the communist threat that it once was, that a new, a new boogeyman had to be invented. It was now radical Islam that threatened the West. And this boogeyman was used for the same purposes, while the, the same ruling class paradoxically imported radical Islamists by the millions they told us we had to be afraid of radical Islam and to allow the erosion of our freedoms and, and allow increased control and expanding never-ending wars while they also told us 
to embrace these Islamists here at home. The same doublespeak existed in the 1980s. Be afraid of communism and socialism from Russia, but embrace it here at home. Virus is a relic from this era, and much in the same way that the movie The Day the Earth Stood Still was promoting globalism. It was attempting to establish this idea that one world was facing this outside challenge. All of humanity must rally together to overcome this, this alien threat. Virus attempts to do the same thing, only this time the threat isn't from space. It's a biological weapon that's been released from a lab. It's sweeping the world and killing everyone in its path. The Italian flu epidemic has spread worldwide. Reports of staggering death tolls are rolling in from all parts of the globe. Vaccines are in short supply everywhere. A world struck with panic has gone berserk. Martial law is the order of the day. Disruption of communications and shipping has left much of the world isolated in fear. And of course, because this movie was produced in the early 80s, after the virus kills almost everybody on Earth, uh, th there still had to be crazy generals launching nuclear missiles uh, just for good measure and, and wiping out anyone else that might have survived. The only people who survive, in fact, are people that are at a base in Antarctica. One problem is, though, there's 800 men and only 8 women. And this mismatch leads to a, a particularly rapey scene where they dismiss the rape of a woman as just something that's it's just going to happen. You know, of course there's of course the eight women are going to get raped. There's 800 men. And I can't help but notice this this minimization or really normalization of rape in movies in the in the 1970s and into the early 80s. Uh, it really it really does make me think that boomers were just kind of rapey. And now just like everything else the boomers did back then we have to pay for it now. Now, a slightly more contemporary film was the 1995 movie Outbreak from the philosemitic 90s where a neurotic Jew and his two black friends ignore orders so they can save the world from the evil white guy. While the army guns down the 90s Hollywood version of right-wingers that don't want to be quarantined, but not before Kevin Spacey dies of super AIDS. This movie isn't just unrealistic, it's, it's asinine. But one takeaway I think the audience leaves the theater with, aside from what I mentioned already about the, the Jewish superhero protecting the world from Whitey, is that while it might be a tough call to make, it's actually perfectly reasonable for the federal government to lock down an entire town as soon as they find a few infected people until everyone's infected, and then just firebomb the entire city, killing everyone for the greater good. Speaking of killing everyone, let's not forget the, the countless zombie movies that have sprung up in the last few decades, almost all of which feature some kind of virus. You know, everything from 28 Days Later to a movie actually just called Pandemic. The one thing that all of these movies and television shows have in common is that once a person is infected, they're already dead, and they should be treated as, as something dangerous. And in fact, not just dangerous, disposable. The infected are to be feared and to be shown no mercy. The infected are something terrifying. The entirety of these films and, and television shows and video games and books is spent running away from the infected, hiding in seclusion from the infected, killing the infected, killing the infected, and killing the infected. Mass murder of these infected is completely justified because they're no longer people. They might look like your mother or your wife or your brother, but now they're infected. They aren't people. They're dangerous, terrifying monsters that need to be killed in the most violent way possible before they infect you. The number of these, these trauma-filled films, TV shows, video games, and books, it's staggering. And it, it's really kind of a weird genre to have if you think about it. The zombie genre is, is a relatively new phenomenon. And you have to wonder what role this genre has been playing in the public sphere of the invisible enemy. The invisible enemy? 
but even though all these movies and films and TV shows and, and so forth, they have these themes in common. They have this fear, amplification. I, I still couldn't get it out of my head. What makes Contagion so different? Like, why is it so you know, technically accurate, you might say? Why does it stand out and seem to coincide with today's reality? And I couldn't imagine the filmmakers just simply getting lucky. So I decided to do some digging into the people behind the film. So it turns out that director Steven Soderbergh worked closely with Larry Brilliant on coming up with the script. Larry Brilliant. A man of means with a fake sounding name and no explanation as to where his massive wealth comes from, and a matching, almost unbelievable backstory of traveling the world with bands of hippies, spreading the virus of the 1960s counterculture to Europe and the Middle East, and then curing diseases like smallpox for the World Health Organization because an Indian sage told him that he had a vision. I'm not making that up. Founding health-related NGOs left and right, creating one of the first online communities in the world, Well.com, which Time Magazine claims paved the way for all e-commerce, from Amazon to eBay. Ah, yes, Larry Brilliant, who became a media sensation out of nowhere, when for some reason he became the official doctor of Native American protesters who occupied Alcatraz Island for 19 months in 1969. Ah, yes, Larry Brilliant, Totally a real name, of course. Who was then fortuitously cast in a hippie movie, the sequel to Woodstock Nation, with bands like the Grateful Dead, and then traveled around Europe and Turkey, Iran, Afghanistan, and Pakistan in a rented bus full of random people before getting hired by the World Health Organization to eradicate smallpox. Yes, the aptly named Larry Brilliant is credited with the eradication of smallpox, and what an exciting life Larry, last name totally real, has had, who was also the first executive director of Google.org, the philanthropic arm of Google, where he chose exactly which programs did or didn't get funded with Google's millions. And then, of course, later he became president of the Skull Foundation, the philanthropic organization for the co-founder of eBay, Jeff Skull. Ah, yes. Donor to the Clinton Foundation, Larry Brilliant. The same Larry Brilliant who has shared a stage with Richard Rockefeller on multiple occasions to discuss everything from philanthropy to using MDMA to treat PTSD. Yes, this Larry Brilliant who says billions could get the virus if we don't get a vaccine, a, a global vaccine that will be administered globally by the World Health Organization. One million cases it's not clear to me that there are enough speed bumps in the path to stop it from going to 1 billion cases. We need to have a global program, hopefully run by WHO, which is like the smallpox eradication program or the uh, polio program, to go and find every case and put a ring of vaccine around it and then begin the final phase of defeating. Who will then, of course, give you a vaccine passport that allows you to go into public much like in the film Contagion. As far as having immune individuals who are badged with a Coachella-like wristband or a, a card with their photo ID on it or some other way of identifying them because they've had a serological test that shows that their body has made antibodies to this virus. The only way you can make antibodies is, is if you've encountered the virus and nine out of 10 times, it's because you're immune, unless your immune system um, is not adequate. We need to have that, that is more important than people think. Larry Brilliant, who said back in 2007, four years before the release of the film Contagion, that he wants to create an AI surveillance system that spies on all your social media looking for signs of a pandemic. Well, my Ted wish is for you to help build a global system, an early warning system, to protect us against humanity's worst nightmares. Let's increase the websites that they crawl from 20,000 to 20 million. Let's increase the languages they crawl from seven to 70 or more. Now, I want you to understand what Larry Brilliant is suggesting in this TED Talk, which would later win him a $100,000 investment to start 
a program like he's describing that would monitor the internet in search of the first signs of a pandemic. This was in 2007, before people were talking about AI, and of course, well before the recent documents that were released showing that the same people that hired Larry Brilliant to head the philanthropic arm of Google, Google Google.org, were telling the U.S. government that we need a Chinese-style social credit score system to do exactly the kinds of things Larry was trying to do in 2007. Now, this system, although he doesn't use the the new buzz term AI, was essentially an AI that that would scrape web pages uh, from local media and social media, and then it would look at this data for early signs of a pandemic. And honestly, if that's all it was, if that's how it stayed, there's really nothing wrong with that idea. Now, it's not clear that Larry Brilliant is asking for this kind of data, but the people that gave him his job at Google certainly are. They want this pandemic-detecting AI to have access to everything from medical records to private messages and even access to microphones on your devices to listen for signs that you might be sick. Perhaps you're coughing, or maybe the tone of your voice is changing. They want access to your camera to see if maybe you're looking a little pale today. They want thermal imaging cameras posted throughout urban areas to check your temperature. Maybe your stride doesn't look very healthy. The expression on your face might be of some concern. They want all of this data collection, all of this surveillance. Constant sentinel surveillance. To detect clusters of possible infections so that the system can quarantine and vaccinate these clusters before they turn into global pandemics. And look, to some people, this might all seem like a reasonable use of technology. Larry Brilliant might even genuinely want to deploy this technology for the reason that he says he wants to, to eradicate all diseases before they start. He might genuinely be motivated by the desire to save lives. Larry Brilliant, while I doubt it, given what else we know about him, might be just a useful idiot. Just give up all of your privacy and self-determination to a centralized system programmed and administered by faceless technocrats that want to manage their cattle as efficiently as possible. A system with access to everything, every detail about you. How many times did you use the bathroom today? How many hours did you sleep? Did you take a different route to work today? Did you sound angry or stressed today? Certainly, mental health is a part of health. Why would the system not include some kind of component to try to determine if you might be a danger to yourself or to others? Maybe you need to be medicated or taken into custody or your children taken into custody. Why wouldn't this AI be used to develop profiles to identify political dissidents? And when the system decides that you fit the profile, now you're not allowed to fly on airplanes or maybe even use your bank account. Because you've met some criteria set by people like Larry and his friends, who we'll talk about here in a second. Even if this data isn't abused in any kind of official capacity, we also know because of Edward Snowden and WikiLeaks and other whistleblowers that the data will be abused. It's a simple equation. Don't be naive. Knowledge is power. Power corrupts. Absolute power corrupts absolutely. We've seen this movie before and we know how it ends. The types of systems that are being promoted by people like Larry Brilliant under the guise of public safety at a time when people are afraid are no different than the Patriot Act and the FISA courts that were put in place after 9-11. Power handed to the government by a public that was afraid not of a virus at that time, but of terrorists. And as everyone is aware, it didn't take long before the spying enabled by the Patriot Act and the FISA courts were abused by people in power to retain and increase their power. And isn't it convenient that the people that are seeking this power have always found an opportunity to exploit the fears of the people who typically fight to protect their freedoms? I was at an event called the Renaissance Weekend a couple of years ago, and we had just made a movie called Contagion. So I showed this movie at the Renaissance Weekend, and. Uh, one of the most conservative Republicans in the country, uh, part of a think tank that everybody knows, uh, he spoke after me. 
And he said, you know, uh, I saw Contagion. I saw the movie. I realize now what a pandemic is like. I tried to dig deeper into the origins of Larry Brilliant, who seems to have sprung out of nowhere and whose Wikipedia page is most likely curated, and I wasn't able to find much. I discovered that his father was Joe Brilliant of Detroit, who was in the coin-operated business, running jukeboxes and other coin-operated machines, a business that makes it extremely easy to launder money and to avoid taxes, I might add. A business he ran until, according to transcripts from a Senate hearing with then-Senator John F. Kennedy, who was investigating mob ties to these same businesses, he was forced out when bigger players from Chicago, with the help of none other than Jimmy Hoffa, slowly but surely pushed him out of the coin-operated game. I also found evidence that he was involved in philanthropy to some extent and that he was involved with uh, local Jewish charities and clubs and that their last name was either Brillant, according to Ancestry.com, or Brillantov, or quote, something like that, according to an interview he gave Rolling Stone. Either way, his family were Russian Jews that immigrated around the turn of the century. And while it was difficult to turn up really anything else, I did find an article in the Detroit Jewish Chronicle claiming that Larry had been involved with the NAACP from age 15, and that he met his wife in his B'nai B'rith youth group. The article also explained why Larry was so eager to heal the world. Tikkun Olam, the term Gentiles everywhere, are slowly becoming more and more familiar with. Aside from Larry Brilliant's involvement in the film Contagion, another interesting name attached to the film was its producer, Michael Schamberg. As it would happen, Michael Schamberg's beginnings are also deeply rooted in the hippie movement of the 1960s in San Francisco. Michael Schamberg has always been interested in creating social change with film and video, and has been trying to accomplish just that since his involvement in groups he founded, like the Rain Dance Corporation, and then later TVTV TV in the 1960s and 70s. These were nonprofits he established that were funded by the Rockefeller Foundation. In 1969, while Larry was playing the hero doctor on TV, Portable video equipment, expensive though it might be, was just becoming available. With money from the Rockefeller Foundation, Schamberg wanted to leverage the brand new medium of video to promote things like anarcho-socialism and the hippie counterculture. One of Schamberg's more popular Rockefeller-funded pieces was In Hiding, a conversation with Abby Hoffman. Abby Hoffman was a Jewish communist and founder of the Youth International Party, and a leader of the flower power movement. Abby Hoffman is truly the Jewish revolutionary spirit personified. See, I can I could hold you off forever just by using uh, uh, theatrical techniques. I'll oh, show you, see, oh, you be straight. Okay. You be straight, guy. And you push me, give me the cop. Come on, man, you fucker! Come on, come on, take me! See? Yeah. You ain't gonna touch me. What a propagandist does is establish the vision as a reality. And then uh, the, 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 the people, the masses, uh, the press that moves towards that vision. While leading the flower power movement in the late 1960s, he promoted casual sex and casual drug use as the answer to all of the problems facing the American youth. He also hated the Christian religion and talked candidly in an interview how he was forbidden by his parents to say the name Jesus. I don't know about you people, but at least when Abby and I were growing up, hmm. as Jews, we were not allowed to utter the word Jesus. And when it came time for all these Christmas carols, and when you get to the word Jesus, <laughs> right, right, oh. <laughs> stoner. <laughs> We couldn't say it. These are the people that influenced and grew up to become our ruling elite. These are the people that want you to trust them with every piece of data they can possibly collect on you so they can heal the world. These are the masters of media, social engineering, and propaganda. The well-funded masters that play the long game. And these are the people that are winning that game. 
These are the people that will design the world your children will be forced to live in if you don't stand up and take the wheel of history and yank it from them. If you sit idly by, you're giving them permission to choose your destination, and I don't know about you, but I don't like where we're headed. For Black Pilled, I'm Devin Stack. If you like my videos, make sure you like and subscribe. Make sure you share. If you want to support my work, you can grab a copy of my book. The link is in the description, or you can send crypto to one of the addresses below.